Um, all right, so I'm Doug Davis from IBM. I am the co-chair of the serverless working group, a working group under in the CNCF. Um, I'm also co-chair of the Cloud Events project, which we'll be talking about a little bit in a second. Uh, first of all, the agenda. First, talk a little bit about the serverless working group, how it got started, a little bit of an overview. Uh, talk a little bit about Cloud Events, just a quick intro because it came from the serverless working group. Talk a little bit about workflow, um, what's new for the serverless working group, and then a little bit of birds of feather. This is the one you should be afraid of because this is the one I'm going to make you talk. <laughs> okay? Um, in Barcelona uh, for KubeCon, we actually had an 80 minute long session where we covered the first couple of things in like 15 minutes and then we spent the rest of 85 minutes on that birds of feather session. And for me, anyway, it was really, really useful. Whether you guys think of that, I don't know, but I need to get input from you guys. So that's what the birds of the feather was about. So just a warning. Okay, so let's talk about the serverless working group. Um, in mid 2017, the uh, CNCF decided they wanted to take a look at what's going on with serverless. It was a relatively new technology, and they weren't sure what, if anything, the CNCF would do about it. So they started the serverless working group um, for the main purpose of doing that investigation. Come on in. <laughs> Uh, basically doing that investigation. And what the serverless working group did was basically produce a white paper that gave an overview of the technology itself. So what is serverless? How does it compare to the other technologies out there? Containers as a service, platform as a service. What's the difference between serverless versus function as a service? That kind of stuff, okay? Um, also gave an overview about the technology itself in terms of what usually goes into a serverless platform, right? Um, talked about the state of the ecosystem. What's going on there relative to the open source community and proprietary type stuff? We didn't give any recommendations in terms of what was good or just bad, just provide an overview of what's out there today. That overview is also manifested in not just the white paper, but also that little landscape document which we produced, which is basically nothing more than a spreadsheet of all the various serverless platforms out there, what types of features each one had, stuff like that. It wasn't a judgment about which one was good or bad, didn't try to compare them. It was just for someone trying to figure out what's going on in serverless, Here's a list of things to choose from if you want to play with it. That's all it was, just an overview of what's going on in the ecosystem. And then finally, in the white paper, we did a recommendation se section, which basically gave recommendations for the Technical Oversight Committee in terms of what should they do next relative to serverless. And most of the recommendations were around things like education, right? Educate the community about serverless, where it's appropriate to use it, where it's not appropriate to use it, that kind of stuff. But one very important thing there was what can the serv what can the Cloud of what can CNCF do next relative to interoperability or solving pain points for the community itself? And one of the things we noticed was that um, serverless, in many cases, is really about events, right? Events are flowing around and they're using the events to actually kick off invocations of functions or serverless functions. So we started looking at what around events possibly was an interoperability problem, and we realized that. Uh, while there are all these events are flowing around, there's no real standard way to sort of analyze events just to help them get from point A to point B. And that's what Cloud Events was really all about. And that's what they, the serverless working group decided to start up, was a new working group focused on how can you address that one little pain point of how to get an event from point A to point B without having to deal with some of the pain involved. So let's talk a little bit about what that pain actually is. So as I said, you have these events flowing around between clouds, between services, and Everyone, every event is going to be different in some way, right? Every, every business application is going to send out an event or receive an event in a, some sort of proprietary format. And that's fine. We don't want to necessarily change that because that gets their job done. However, when you start talking about sending that event from one point to another, in order for those points in the middle or even the final destination to know what to do with it just to route it to the business processing logic, it usually has to understand that message itself, meaning it has to understand the event and what's going on inside there to make that determination of how to do the proper routing, filtering, or whatever. Well, what Cloud Events is trying to do is trying to come up with a standard way to represent the common metadata needed to do that routing for you. Now, keep in mind, we're not trying to reinvent another Cloud Events common format that everybody you know, is supposed to use, all events are supposed to look this way. That's not our point. We're just trying to define the bare minimum metadata needed to do this base routing infrastructure that we're talking about. So let's take a look at what that actually means in practice, because it's really not that complicated. So first, let's take this HTTP message, right? Very simple message, a couple HTTP headers, and then in the body, you have some JSON, nothing big. 
But in order for me to understand how to route this to the appropriate processor, I have to understand that JSON, right? I have to understand basically the business logic. And that's, that's a lot to ask of me as a piece of middleware, right? Think of the middleware as, let's say, a proxy, just trying to get it from point A to point B, right? If he wants to route all new item type of actions, he has to understand this, that it's JSON, if there's a field called action, and there's a thing called new or value called new item to route it someplace. That's actually a lot of work for somebody to understand when you're trying to make a piece of middleware be as generic as possible. Well, what Cloud Events does is says, look, here are some four required attributes of Cloud Events. Spec version. So this is the version of Cloud Events spec, very basic stuff. Type. What is the type of the event that's flowing through here? So if you look at what's happening here, is we're saying, okay, this is a uh, big com.bigcode.new event or new item. So new item is is technically the action itself or the type of event, but we prefix this with com.bigco because it's from that that source, right? Just so we get a little bit of uniqueness to it, because there could be dot less event producers producing a new of item type of event. So this just distinguishes it from those guys. Then you have the source. So who sent this event? In this particular case, bigco.com slash repo, right? And finally, just some unique identifier. Think of it just a UUID. And that's it. There's not a whole lot here, and that's the point. It's minimal amount of data so that anybody who receives this can look at this and say, oh, okay, I know that there's a string called type. And it's going to describe the type of event. So I can set up a very generic framework that says route all events from, say, bigco, I'm sorry, from com.bigco.star to this processor over there. Or all events that end in maybe new item go over there, right? Some sort of basic logic that doesn't necessarily force you to understand what's in the body, but can do simple string sort of searches on either the type or the source to do whatever routing you need, right? If, if, if that's all you need is that basic routing, right, without understanding the business logic. And that's all it's trying to do, right? So in a lot of ways, the same way the HTTP headers don't really tell you much about the message itself in terms of the business logic. It's just there to help you get the message from point A to point B, to go through some middleware that doesn't really understand what's going on, but can understand basic HTTP common headers. That's all we're doing here, right? Very simplistic thing. But with that, it's, it's able to give you a level of interoperability between the various platforms, right? Because as I said, the middleware doesn't have to understand the business logic anymore just to do its job. And that's critical to what we're all about here. Now, this is the binary format, meaning you have an existing message, you're just sprinkling some metadata in there, that's it. If for some reason, though, you want to actually stick that data inside the body, as say, for example, JSON, we do tell you how that looks, just to get some interoperability, right? So notice, for example, the content type changed from application JSON to application cloud events JSON. Application JSON now appears down here on a cloud event property we define called data content type. So the HTTP body goes into a data attribute. But everything else is basically the same, just wrappered in JSON, right? So you could use this as your global event format if you really wanted to, but that's not the point. Because we don't necessarily want to force people to use this if they don't want to. If you have a format that works for you, great, use it. Just sprinkle it with metadata with a couple of metadata, and that's it. So that that's basically cloud events in a nutshell. We define some metadata, we define how it appears inside certain formats like JSON, or how it appears in certain transports like HTTP, and that's all there is to it. We have a couple of S we have some SDKs that help you do the generation of the messages or processing the messages to get it to and from those formats. So SDKs will do that for you, and that's it. Okay? Very simple idea. But we're seeing this start to get some real traction because people are looking for this type of standardization for their middleware. Okay? So in terms of the deliverables, we have the specification itself. We're at 0, uh, 0 0.3 right now, just released a couple weeks ago. We have a couple of event formats, JSON, AMQP, Protobuf, and we have some transports, uh, some of the more popular ones. We're adding new ones all the time. Um, Kafka is actually the next one that should be delivered very soon. We also have a primer that gives you some uh, insight into some of the decisions we made and why we made them. Because a lot of people look at this and say, well, that's interesting that you have you know, these properties, but why don't you have a property that tells you where the message is going? Right? That's what the primer talks about. The primer will explain to you why we don't have a destination field in there, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. So it gives you, as I said, gives you some insights. We have some SDKs for marshaling and unmarshaling the data, different several of the languages, and then we have some extensions. Okay? But that's basically it in a nutshell. Now, the reason I mention this is because this is the first 
concrete deliverable, aside from the white paper, from the serverless working group. And as I said, it's about trying to get interoperability or address pain points for the community. Okay? So this is at 0 0.3. Technically, it's, it's at 0 0.9 in terms of uh, maturity level. We are actually hoping to go to 1.0 within a couple of weeks. And so then, then the question is, OK, what are we going to do after that? It's the same people working in the service working group at Cloud Events. We just put the service working group on hold while we finish up this. So what is next for the service working group at Cloud Events, which would hopefully come in a couple of weeks? So one of the things we decided to work on a long time ago was something called workflow. So when you have these serverless functions out there, a lot of times we found that people want to sort of string them together, right? Put, event comes in, goes to one function, that produces another event, goes to another function, maybe there's some conditional logic, you need to branch off, do something. There's a whole workflow or pipeline type of uh, structure people want to define. And there are lots of different ways to do it. There's plenty of technology out there that already does that. Of course, it's not interoperable. Right? The way you define it in one system isn't necessarily going to work in other systems. So we thought, well, the notion is out there. Can we make life easier for people to, by trying to standardize or come up with a common way to define that workflow? And that's what this workflow project is going to be working on. Um, so as I said, the goal here is to define the basic primitives for how to string together various function invocations. Right? So it's going to include some basic primitives in there like states and steps, triggers, references to the functions are going to get invoked, possibly some filtering, that kind of stuff. The important thing to know here that it's talking about how to actually wire these things together, meaning what comes next and how to decide what comes next. It's not going to necessarily talk about how to invoke the function itself, in particular function signatures. That's not something that workflow gets into. It, it ignores that. That is one of the things that we're looking at possibly looking to standardize later from a serverless working group perspective, but workflow doesn't get into that. It doesn't talk about how to invoke the function. It just says what function to invoke next. Very important distinction. Um, it also doesn't talk about the instead formats or metadata. That's, that, that's for someone else to solve. This is just about basically putting the wires between the various boxes. And again, this is all about fostering portability and interoperability across platforms. And this is the second step for the serverless working group. Of course, the cloud events being the first step. So let's take a little. Let's take a look at what uh, the workflow actually means from a, um, from a more concrete perspective. So workflow means execution flow, and really what we're talking about is a state machine. At least in this particular proposal that we have in front of us right now. So the state machine is sort of represented here. We'll talk about the various pieces in there. So the first are obviously events because that's where <coughs> that's we're talking about processing here. So events aren't just the thing that comes into the system. So we have, obviously, an event coming into the workflow itself, the event trigger itself. But as you go from state to state, those are actually events as well. Right? So the result of a function getting invoked is treated as another event that then moves on to the next state. So obviously, the states here uh, talk about what's the current state of the entire system. Right? Was there a failure? Do you keep going to the next step? Is there a uh, if statement, like right, the, the switch statement in there, basically this statement, right? Does this, after this one state, do you span out to multiple functions or multiple other states? That kind of stuff. And then finally, you have actions, basically the functions themselves, right? So some of the states will actually invoke other functions. Other states lead on to other states themselves, like the switch state goes on to the task state. And that's basically the, 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 the basic idea of the current proposal for a workflow document. The current state of this is, is that it's only at a 0.1 stage. Um, we started working on this. We used to have weekly calls. But then we realized that because the same people are in both groups, meaning cloud events and serverless, uh, they really didn't have time to do both at the same time. So we kind of put this one on hold. Uh, as I said, after this cloud events stuff goes to 1.0, we'll probably circle back around to continue working on here. But if you have any interest in the workflow stuff, please look at the serverless working group. We'd love to get your feedback on that. Uh, it's still very, very rough in the early stages. So there's lots of room for you guys to help shape it if it does actually meet your needs. As I said, uh, we are looking at what to do next in the service working group with workflow being just one of the possible things. I listed some of the other ones on there. Um, I'd mentioned things like function signatures. That's been a very popular one. Um, in all honesty, for some of these things, while I think they'd be really, really good to standardize on, there is some level of resistance in the group to do too much too quickly. There's a lot of people that worry that if you standardize something, it's going to limit people's creativity to expand it or to 
to explore the, the possibilities with that particular domain. So we have to tread very, very lightly here because a lot of people are very scared of standards, especially in the open source community. But if you're interested in e any of these ideas or the other ones you think might be worthy, drop me a note uh, or just come to one of the serverless working group calls. Uh, we'd love to hear what you guys think are the pain points for you to address. Okay? Now, that was actually very quick, 15 minutes. Now we get to the part that you're dreading. This is questions for you guys. Okay? Because what I want to do now is, okay, I told you about cloud events, I told you about the serverless working group, I told you about some of the things we think are pain points for people that we want to consider working on. But the problem is, that's just our view, right? The cloud events working group or the serverless working group, we have, at one point in time, we've had, I think, over 70 different companies, or representative from companies appear. That's a lot of people. Um, but one thing that I actually think we're missing, we, we do have some, but we need more, is the end community input. Right? We need people who are actually using this stuff on a daily basis, not the people producing the infrastructures, producing the, the cloud providers. We need people and users basically giving us feedback in terms of when you go to use Lambda, IBM Cloud Functions, Google Cloud Functions, whatever, what are the pain points you're experiencing? Right? And that's what I, this next section is really about. Right? This, is, this is the bird or feather thing. So let's start off with some simple questions, even before, even before that one. How many people here are using containers today in production? Really? Not everybody's hand went up. You guys are, <laughs> this, is, this is the CNCF. You guys should all be saying, yes, we love containers and we're all using it. No. So that's interesting. Okay? And that's actually, I'm not surprised. It's disappointing for me because this is what my job, right? But it doesn't surprise me because I found that there's a lot of, not resistance, but it's, a, it's not as quickly growing as we would have hoped. Right? The, for whatever reason, people aren't picking it up on it. Um, maybe because it takes time to m migrate your infrastructure. Maybe they're still nervous about it. For whatever reason, I'm not that surprised. So less hands are going to go up, I'm sure. How many people are using serverless in production today? One, two, three. OK. OK, so I'm going to pick on you three then a lot for the following questions. <laughs> OK. Well, actually, first of all, for you guys who are actually using either serverless in production or just playing around with serverless, would you be comfortable telling me what kind of things you use it for? Actually, do we have a microphone? I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on you guys. So you raise your hand first. <laughs> um, actually, we we kind of play around uh, serverless uh, right now. We, we're not like in mass production. It's just a few use cases. So what, what kind of use cases are you using? What, 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 brought, what, 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 what are the first types of use cases you found interesting to possibly consider? Uh, our work, our workloads um, work, uh, are running on AWS. Mm -hmm. So we're using it for uh, auto scaling. Okay. And, um, so when a, when a server uh, is, uh, a spot server um, Gets well. We got notified that scuffs are will be gone, and we'll use a uh, lambda to like drain everything on that server. And also, we're using it to um, collect the logs uh, from EKS. Uh -huh. okay. um, okay. That's it. Okay. And I assume that it's the auto scaling up as well as the scaling down to zero that interests you, right? Uh, well, <laughs> that's that's so just a use case. Uh, and also, uh, we're using lambdas to calculate some custom metrics for our scaling. Okay. Uh, cool. uh -huh. Okay. Only because you're closest to me, I'm going to pick on you too. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, actually, I am building a function as a service in my uh, company, ByteDance. Uh, I'm from ByteDance. ByteDance. Do you know ByteDance? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, our use case is about two scenarios. Uh, first one is the uh, service. Uh, we call light service uh, about some Node.js uh, service. We we use uh, service uh, in our uh, company to run. And another use case is the uh, uh, cloud uh, the, uh, async event, uh, such as a Kafka event and an uh, object storage event, such as that. If uh, uh, for example, if you have uh, some event into Kafka, you can uh, watch the uh, consume the Kafka event. Then uh, today I use the cloud event to uh, describe the uh, 
describe the event. Did uh, I hear that right? You use cloud event? Yeah, I use the cloud event, yes. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, in a, in in a in the users function, I also uh, uh, I also send the event as a cloud event type into the uh, function. A user writes the function, and it will receive the event. The cloud the event is also a cloud event. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Why are you using serverless as opposed to just stand up a server that just waits all the time? Your question is about uh, why do we use serverless? Yeah, why use serverless instead of just a standalone server that's yeah. running all all day long? Yeah, it's a uh, serverless has some advantage. And in our in our use case, um, the if if we maintain standalone service in our production, uh, the we need to um, scale the max capacity every time. So it's hard to. Uh, decide for user to decide what the capacity is. So the service is the main advantage for saving our resources. Yep. Okay. Auto scaling side. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. So the next question on here, I believe, is for everybody else aside from those three, why aren't you considering serverless? And last time I asked this question in Barcelona. I got some really interesting answers. Is anybody willing to raise their hand to say why they're a little resistant to play with serverless at this point in time? No one? <laughs> there has to be some reason you're not playing with it. Is it just too new? Is it just you're not comfortable with it yet? Any answer is fine. I'm just curious. You guys, are, see, I was afraid this would be a very quiet audience. <laughs> you guys are going to make me do all the talking. OK, so just maybe this will help. So when I in Barcelona, some of the reasons I got was or were related to with containers as a service, or with containers, we're told, hey, you know, take your monolithic application and split it up into microservices, and that's fine conceptually. It's a it's rather it's sometimes it's a hard task though, right? Where do you draw those lines? Where do you draw the boundaries to actually have the little microservices? Well, with functions or serverless, we're now saying, hey, great, now do it again. Right, take your microservices and split them up into tiny little, little, you almost like utilities, right? And again, it back, it's back to where do you draw those lines, right? How do you then split it up? How do you then manage not just five microservices, now 50 functions, right? And people are a little nervous about that because they're not sure about whether the tooling is there yet, right? How to do the split. The education around it is a little bit nerve wracking for people. And that was actually a, one of the things we learned most about the audience in Barcelona was there's just some fear and they're not ready for that progression yet. And they also were afraid that the tooling wasn't there yet to help them. Because they feel like there's a challenge with just, for example, gathering logs from you know your five microservices. Oh my gosh. Now these things are you know exploded out to have so much and then they're gonna scale. How do you manage all the logs across that? And there are tools to help you, but they weren't sure whether they were mature enough, and that was part of the reason they were doing it. Anybody want to say anything yet? No. Okay, fine. <laughs> You guys are going to make me work. Yes. Uh, actually, we are using serverless in our production, but the service we are using is not a true service. He cannot scale to zero. Yes. Uh, so we, so so they provide us some uh, reserve mode. Mm -hmm. We 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 uh, we give them some volume, uh, then they scale to that volume mm -hmm. to serve us. And uh, what holds us uh, from uh, using it, the first one is the scalability, uh, like the scale to zero, the, the ability to scale to zero. And the other th uh, problem I want to mention is that. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sure if it's the scale to zero. Are you saying that's a problem for you because you can't go to zero or because you want to, but your infrastructure won't let you? Uh, the infrastructure does not provide the ability to scale to zero, so okay. I did not raise my hand okay. previously oh, okay. because because I thought that was not a true service. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, the second one. The second one is that uh, the uh, we uh, rely a lot of uh, microservice behind us, but they are not uh, a bus service. They are traditional uh, microservices. Okay. And they are they are not serverless. They are not serverless. And what's worse is that uh, we need to use some rich client to call them, and they provide some uh, jar file, a Java uh, rich 
client okay. to call them. And we are Node.js application. Okay. It is hard for us to uh, to 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 uh, in, interoperate with them. So uh, though though there are some uh, mesh there, but they can only do some uh, common service. But for some business uh, service, we it is hard for us to uh, translate those uh, rich client uh, into the mesh. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult for our business to turn fully. Uh, serverless. Interesting. Okay. okay. So just just for your reference, I'm not a purist. So the fact that you don't scale down to zero, I, that's still serverless to me. I know a lot of people think serverless has to go to zero. For me, serverless is a little more abstract, and to me, it's like the auto scaling and and the function level type stuff. But even then, but okay. But thank you for for providing that. That's useful. Thank you. Okay. So. <clears throat> um, since most of you are either shy or not using serverless, this, quite, this next question may not apply to you. Um, so when you guys are actually using serverless, though, what are the pain points for you? I mean, you guys are using cloud events, so hopefully that's helping you a little. But um, are you finding, for example, <clears throat> that you're tied down to one particular architecture, right? You said you're using AWS, I believe, right? Do you feel like you're locked in or do you feel like you could take your, your, your Lambda to another platform and easily run it there, right? Is portability of functions something that's, that's, that worries you, right? Is the, because the function signature, for example, will probably change when you go to someplace else because Lambda has their own little function signature with context being passed in. Other ones can have their own way of doing it. Does that kind of stuff worry you at all in terms of portability? Or do you feel like, eh, it might be a little bit of work, but you can easily port it over to Google Cloud or IBM Cloud or something like that in their function platform. What kind of pain points do you guys have relative to portability, tooling, debugging, anything else? Anything you want to mention? There you go. Ooh, thank you. Give it a sec. There you go. Yeah. Um, for us, uh, currently we're we're not worrying about portability because uh, we just migrated from on-premise data center to AWS. So right now we're uh, it, it's it's a phase where we uh, like uh, locked in uh, AWS. We don't worry about that. Okay. Uh -huh. um, but we, for me, my pr from my personal experience, we uh, I'm a little worried about um, how to like I feel I feel isolated of the code like uh, in different uh, lambdas. What do you mean by isolated? Because well, for for microservices, it's a it's an independent um, piece, a piece of software that actually completes uh, a meaningful um, functions features. Right. But uh, serverless for serverless some that functions is too much, too much smaller. That sm to a point that m maybe it just not that meaningful uh, sometimes. Is, it, is that? Is that a problem, or is it just a mental model you have to get used to? Uh, I think it's a mental model. Okay. Uh -huh. um, uh, uh, because I, sometimes I couldn't tell uh, the the upstream of this lambda function, uh, and I, I I certainly could tell the downstream, but uh, it makes well kind of make me worried about well uh, what if we have thousands of uh, lambdas and I don't know or really don't know how it flows the data how uh, how it flows. So mm -hmm. understanding how the data flows between the various lambdas is a concern for you. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. okay. That helps. Okay, cool. Is there anybody else who'd like to volunteer for pain points? Oh, here we go. Cool. Yeah, I think uh, uh, one pain point is that uh, uh, all the, the developers uh, yeah, use the tool that have some more heavy programs. Uh, like tra traditional application, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also some application was the development by .NET. Um, uh, it's hard to um, uh, uh, develop again with uh, Microsoft Service, so uh, it costs the time yep. uh, to do that. Okay, thank you. That's that's consistent with what I heard in Barcelona. So thank you. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we are running a little low on time here, but so one last question for you guys. I've got actually two last, hopefully. Now you mentioned, actually it's interesting, you were just talking about you have current workloads and it's, it's a challenge to, to split them up and actually make them into functions and stuff. Are there workloads that you'd like to see supported? So for example, uh, one of the things that I hear uh, um, differing opinions on 
is whether, for example, serverless should support streaming, right? Are those the type, you know, is that something you want? Because a lot of people think of serverless as small little functions, short-lived. Um, in fact, you know, like Lambda, for example, won't let you run functions for certain minutes and stuff like that. But what if you want to have a function that actually runs for a couple hours because it's doing some stream processing, right? Do anybody have any use cases that push the boundaries of what you can do in current in current serverless platforms that you want to mention that can't don't work well today? Okay, so <laughs> running out of time anyway. So the one other thing I wanted to find out about is so you have functions as service, you have platform as a service, you have containers as service. In all three of these, you're basically running containers under the covers, right? Different scale of the size of containers. Obviously, functions are probably smaller than containers of service. Platform of service may be bigger than both of them, depending on your point of view. To me, the split between those three worlds is almost artificial, right? Why is it that you only get auto scaling in serverless? Why don't you get auto scaling in platform as a service or containers of service, right? And if you look at a project like Knative, they're almost trying to bring those three worlds together. For those of you who have played around in Knative, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm wondering whether you guys feel like you're being forced to choose artificially between the three platforms or whether you would prefer a world where it's just, here's the container, here's how I want it to behave, and you don't care about what it's called in terms of platform versus function versus container as a service. Anybody have that sense or is this all in my head? Just curious. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have an opinion? Or maybe, because to some people, as I said, I'm not a purist, right? But to some people, they care about this stuff. And there's a very strict definition. You don't want to mix the world. I'm just curious, does anybody want to voice an opinion one way or the other? Okay. We have four minutes left. You're out of so you're lucky. I'm not going to force you guys to speak anymore. So just in summary, uh, but thank you for the feedback. I know it wasn't as 80 minutes long, but still the feedback you gave was useful. So thank you very much. So just some links for you. Serverless Working Group, link to the workflow spec for the Cloud Events stuff. Some links there to the org itself, the spec repo, the SDKs. And as I said, if you're interested in the service working group in terms of what we're going to work on next, whether it's workflow or you have an idea for something else after that, please let us know. Either drop me a note or join the service working group. We have mailing lists and stuff. Let us know what you, what, where your pain points are, where you'd like to see us go next. And so with that, I think we have three minutes left if there are any questions about anything I talked about. Anything? X uh, uh, like the agenda of the working group, right? It seems like the time uh, the time is not very friendly to the Chinese users. Is there any way you can <laughs> improve this? It's like 1 a.m., like something like that. Depending on where you're in China, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, we could. Um, the, the problem is we've only had, I think, one person from China join mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so for one person, it'd be very difficult to convince everybody else to switch. If we got indication that there's more than one, we would definitely consider that. So voice your opinion, ask it, say on the mailing list, you want to join, but it's bad time, and we can do a trial run. Okay. But okay. If, if we don't hear from you, we're not going to think about it, to yep. be honest. Yep. That's what it comes down to, right? The majority wins in that case, unfortunately. Yeah. We will shoot emails to you. Yes, please, send an email yep. to the group, not just to me, okay. to the group. Right, so they see that there's interest. I would personally, I have no problem doing it. I don't know about everybody else, but I'm okay with staying up to midnight occasionally and just switching back and forth. I would, I would do it. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I think I can understand that uh, we do the definition for a cloud event, but uh, for the workflow, uh, the next steps, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, uh, why should we define uh, another workflow? You know, there's, there's so many workflows. What, then what's the benefit? What's, uh, what's right. the difference for service to the workflow? Right. There's, there's that wonderful <laughs> comic strip about, oh my gosh, there are 14 different ways of doing this. We're going to create one that rules them all. One so unified, then, then yeah. 45. Exactly, yeah. That, that's always the concern here. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for it other than the CNCF, I think, has done a really wonderful job of bringing the community together, right? For example, cloud events is not that exciting. It's relatively simple, right? Yeah. But the fact that the, the entire community came together under CNCF to do it 
means something. And so it's going to increase the chances of people adopting it. With something like workflow or anything else we do, I think it's going to be the same thing. You run the risk of it being yet another whatever. But because if we do it right, we're going to have the big players in there. You know, the IBM, Red Hat, Google, Microsoft, hopefully, and Amazon. Hopefully we'll get them to, to participate. And if they participate in the, de in the definition of that thing, I think it increases the likelihood of it being adopted. Because I had the exact same fear with cloud events first started. Right? It's going to be yet another sort of eventing type of thing. Right? But we've heard, I can't mention their names, but we've heard that a lot of the big players are adopting it. And I think it's simply because they've been participating in it and they've had a chance to voice their opinion and shape it to something that meets their needs. And we didn't try to go too far. Right? As I said, we weren't trying to define yet another common event format. We looked at one particular pain point that says, how do we get that common metadata into an event? Right? So if we can do something similar with workflow, granted right, workflow is a lot bigger than four little metadata attributes, but if we can do something similar there, it says if we can cover a certain percentage of the workflows that people are defining today in a relatively common format and get the big boys to agree to support it, then it can take off. But you're right. If we can't get the big boys to adopt it, it's going to go nowhere. And that's the risk we take. So that's why we have to go very slowly and carefully about it. But I do share your concerns. Thank you. And with that, we'll win it over. So thank you very much.